Welcome to the Contending for the Word podcast, a podcast devoted to helping inform, educate, equip, and warn people about false teachers, false movements, and unbiblical philosophies. Now join our host for today's episode and enjoy. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Contending for the Word podcast. My name is Dave, and today I'm one of your co-hosts, and uh, our fellow co well, I have another fellow co-host, Michelle Leslie, uh, with us today. Uh, Michelle has so graciously agreed to join us uh, about once a quarter on, on the show, and I'm really, really excited about that, and so should you. Uh, Michelle is a very trusted uh, women's Bible teacher and a very trusted voice in speaking out against false teachers. And so, Michelle, I'm really excited to have you join the team here. Well, thank you so much. It's so great to be here, Dave. I'm looking forward to our discussion today. I think it'll be really helpful to uh, a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So guys, uh, today we're gonna talk about John and Lisa Bevere. And uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with this, um, Doreen Virtue and I did a video about, it's about a year ago now, um, and Doreen and I have both gotten a lot of pushback on that video, you know, uh, from uh, mostly John Lisa Bevere's followers. I, I did not know Michelle at the time when when I did that. I never know. <laughs> I really don't how large and how much influence. But but if all the but if all over the years I've done you know thousands of these recordings. And uh, of all the recordings that I've ever done, this one and the Derek Prince one have been uh, probably the most viewed and the most pushback that I've ever gotten in in any kind of speaking or in any podcast that I've ever done. And so um, as I've thought about that, I thought, well, maybe I should do it. We should do another episode. And I saw, you know, you have spoken out against John and Lisa Bevere. And I thought, well, that, that could be something that, um, you know, we could do. So, um I can I can uh, turn it over to you. Do you have any thoughts on that as well? Um, I, I can certainly understand why you would have gotten the most pushback on those those kinds of videos because uh, you know the the Bible says that we battle not against um, flesh and blood but against principalities and spirits and whatnot. And really, what's going on here underneath all the window dressing of Lisa Bevere or this particular teacher, that particular teacher. Um, whoever it is and whatever kind of ministry that they have. What's going on here is that this is Satan who's out to try to deceive people. And he just, he uses various means and ways and people and circumstances and whatnot. But when, um, when you try to expose what he's doing, he gets mad. And, and those who uh, are children of the father of laws, they get mad because they follow him. And so um, this is what happens when, whenever we expose a false teacher, um, their, their followers get mad. And this has been happening for thousands of years. If you'll just look back in Judges 6, when Gideon, uh, God told Gideon to tear down the altar of Baal and the Asherah pole. And he went out, he was scared, you know, of the people and and rightly so you see further in the story uh he was so scared of them that he went and did this at night and the next morning all the people now these were israelites came and said who tore these these uh pagan altars down and and whatnot and bring him out and we're going to kill him and so you see the same type of reaction maybe not literal you know, murder today, but you see that same emotion, that same passion, that same outrage. Uh, how, how dare you speak against or do anything against my idol? And, and so this is, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. And so that's why we kind of get this sort of pushback today when we start tipping sacred cows, golden calves, if you will. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Um, I know before we recorded, we were we were both talking about the idea of you know factual information. So we want to make sure that the information we have right is clear and it's uh, true about them. And then the, what we're going to talk about is factual evidence that you know supports the claims that we're making. Now, this is really, really, this is really, really important because people can comment on anything online 
right? They can say whatever they want to. You know, we live in the United States of America. We're, we're for the First Amendment. Uh, we're for the Bill of Rights. So we, we, we are for free speech. Uh, we don't want to censor anybody. But the thing is, is uh, with that comes a responsibility, right? As, and as Christians, even especially, we're to speak the truth in love. We're supposed to speak words that build up and edify. Ephesians 4.15, Ephesians 4.29, Colossians 3. The book of James has something to say about that. Um, you know, on and on, right? We could go on and on with that. But the, 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 the point is, is, is when I've seen the, the, the pushback, I see... I see that they're concerned for John and Lisa Bevere, somebody that they fought, which is understandable, right? But what I don't see is I don't see an actual interaction with the substance, by and large, from their followers with what was said. And that's where, that's one of the reasons why, again, uh, for, for me at least, I wanted to do this episode because it's important to explain at the outset, this is not a personal attack. This, there's nothing right. against about Sean and Lisa Revere. This is about their doctrine, their ideas, what they teach and what they say. Nothing is personal. We're dealing right. with substance. We're dealing with the ideas. We're dealing with the what they're, what they're actually saying and what they mean. Now, their podcasts, they actually have multiple podcasts. Uh, they have Their kids have uh, podcasts. They have YouTubes. Um, so the ones that I'm going to just focus on here is um, uh, conversations with John and Lisa Bevere. They have 108 subscribers on YouTube. Their podcast is uh, one of them is this this one. I think it's is always in the top 50 on um, Apple Podcasts, which means you're talking about ten, potentially tens of thousands of subscribers that are following, listening. Um, in addition, they they write, publish, and speak all over the country, all over the world. Uh, John has uh, in another in another video, which I'll link to in this one with with Doreen. Uh, we found evidence that you know he calls uh, Bill Johnson an apostle. I mean that's concerning. Um, and he's speaking at Bethel, which we're about to look at a clip here, where he's speaking again at Bethel. So, uh, but so this this is really really. Uh, deeply concerning you're absolutely right in what you said you know uh, as with all of these people i think it's fair to say michelle they all speak well right um mm -hmm. they might even get a few things uh, or more than a few things right but what but what the substance is is they throw in they mix the good with the bad and th that that's what makes them in many cases go in air or um sadly even to become heretics and so um you know, I think both of them do speak very well, um, you know, but speaking well uh, doesn't mean that you know what you're talking about. It doesn't mean what? that you're any less of a false teacher or a heretic, you know. Um, so, you know, that's why that's why we have to preach, like Paul said, Christ and who crucified and, uh, you know, let the dust settle wherever it may and trust the spirit to open eyes and ears. Um, so any thoughts on right. that before we get started? Further. Well, I would I would just like to say this is kind of personal about about John and Lisa because we care for them. They are people made in God's image and we don't like to see image bearers getting into all this deception and stuff. We are concerned about them and their eternity. So whenever we um, refute false teaching, and, and that's what we're about to do, and you'll notice that we're, we'll be doing it from scripture and biblical principles. When we do that, it's not just for their followers, it's for them too. They need to be corrected. We don't want to see them um, spend an eternity in hell because they are not saved. And we want them to come to a place where they repent of their false doctrine, believe the truth of the gospel, and believe sound doctrine. So in that sense, it is personal, and we, we do hope that one day John and Lisa will come to believe the truth of Scripture. I 100% I, I agree with that. I mean, and that's why we call uh, in these videos like you've seen I do, I, I call them away, call their followers and, and people away from their teaching. And we have to also be so clear about what you just said because, you know, that, that is that at the heart. If, if they'll watch it, right? If they'll watch it and if they'll consider it prayerfully and with the word of God open, 
um, I think that they they might see their air and the spirit might use that to open their eyes right. and open their followers' eyes. So that's really well said, Michelle. Um, yeah, Amen. Glory to God. Right. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So our first our first clip today is uh, from John Vivere. He's speaking, as I mentioned, he's spoken many times at, at Bethel Church in Reading. He's speaking here in this clip at uh, the Open Heavens Conference in Reading, California. So let's take a look at that now. Now everybody say repent. That's a word a lot of us don't like using. We don't like that word. Why? Because repentance has been so misrepresented. I personally believe it's one of the most beautiful words in the New Testament other than Jesus. If you look at repentance in the Old Testament, it's sackcloth, ashes, mourning, weeping, all of this outward stuff to show that you had remorse. In the New Testament, simply put, do you know what the definition of the word repentance is? It's found over 50 times in the New Testament. It's the Greek word metanoia. The definition is, the most common definition, a change of mind. Everybody say a change of mind. But if you leave it there, you miss the impact, the power of this word. I love the Baker Encyclopedia. It defines it like this. The Baker Encyclopedia says, a change in the whole personality from a simple course of action to God. I love the words whole personality. I can change my mind. I can have a change in the way I think. That's, what, that's the way the repentance is defined. But I'm not necessarily fully persuaded. So repentance does involve the mind, but it goes deeper. It goes to the will. It goes to the emotions. It penetrates to the very core of our heart. We are fully persuaded from our innermost parts. If you look at what Jesus says, and Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 15, he says, from the heart, everybody say, from the heart, come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, and lying. Behavior, whether it's spontaneous or it's habitual, originates from our innermost being, Jesus is saying. So, if repentance is just a change in mind, Jesus would have said, all sexual immorality, theft, and all of this comes from that mind, from our intellect. But it comes from the heart. So repentance is when we become fully persuaded in the very core of our being that what God says is best for me. And I don't care what anyone else says. If you look at the video, Angela was just as shocked as Justin was. What did you think about that? She's the one that got up and left. Now, as absurd as that video is, how can something like this happen? I want you to think with me, how can this happen? If the people in Angela's life never told her that in order to enter a marriage covenant, you had to say goodbye to all your old boyfriends and any new relationships in the future. If nobody ever told her that, she would be shocked at Justin's jealousy. The question I have, and I just can't come to grips with this, is in our modern Western American church, I watch us give altar calls. You've been away from God. You want to come home. Just pray this prayer with me. We don't say one thing often to, un to seekers about repenting and having a change of heart to where we're fully persuaded, I will believe whatever God says about my life, he's my maker, and whatever he says about my life, I'm going to embrace it. So what happens is, we have people coming to Jesus, praying a sinner's prayer, but then they get shocked all of a sudden when they have a rift in their relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because why? They've never left their previous lovers. They've never been told to. Michelle, what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, um, let me start off by saying, and I hope our, our listeners will pay attention to this. Notice how he never brings any scripture into this, or if he does bring scripture into it, he it's sort of paraphrased into his own words, and he never gives you the scripture reference so that you can go look it up and see what it actually says. So pay attention to that for the, the rest of, of this episode. But uh, you, the Bible instructs us to repent of our sin. And did, did he ever mention sin? I mean, he, he said repentance is about believing what God thinks is best for me. Uh, he said that it is leaving your, your former lovers, I guess the things that you love, the idols that you love or whatever, but he never really brings it down to brass tacks. You have sinned against a holy God. You have broken God's law. You are a sinner by birth and by choice. And that is what you need to repent of. That is what you need to turn away from. And you can't change your own mind when you when you repent and you turn to Christ and you believe the truth of the gospel, he changes your mind. He makes you a new creature in Christ with a new mind, a new heart, and new wants. And that is how that happens biblically. What all this this stuff that he's saying here, it's not it's not necessarily all completely a hundred percent heresy or wrong, but he doesn't give you the complete biblical picture of what repentance is. You repent from sin, and he never even says that. No, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, we we know what happened after, you know, just, just to bring this out, right? Um, here, here's a guy who, as we mentioned, he preaches all over the world. He has for years. I myself have been preaching since I was 16. I can't imagine giving a, let alone a sermon or even doing a podcast, uh, especially talking about repentance and not being very clear at the outset about what repentance is like when you when you take a look i think the last time i did pulpit supply actually i preached on psalm 51 um would you, would you, how can you read psalm 51 where david is after he's been confronted this is a response right after david had been confronted by nathan the prophet and he's responding and he's talking about confession of sin he trusts in the mercy of god how he can find uh, cleansing through the blood of christ um how biblical repentance produces obedience by the power of the holy spirit leading to a whole different way of life that honors and pleases god and and so uh you know he never talks about that you know he it, it's the whole it's the whole person that that's partially right right commit yourself to god and and all those things but like you said he never talks about sin and if you never talk about sin it's like how much help are you going to provide the people that are listening to that instruction, that that teaching? And I can't help but think, you know, we have absolutely a, a lot of – I have a lot of patience, and I'm sure you do as well. For somebody that is, is learning, somebody that, you know, is is being instructed and, and growing in these things, but somebody like John and Lisa Bevere, they've been doing this for 30 years. So – um, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a, frankly, I have a different standard for somebody like that because I know what it re is required to a put together a sermon. I know what's required, you know, j uh, actually, uh, interesting enough, RC Sproul once said that he was asked, how do you put together a sermon so fast? Well, he said how long the, his answer was, well, uh, it only takes me an hour to put together a sermon, but I've been, he, and people were amazed and 30 years of preparation. So here's a guy that right. has 30 years of preparation to preach a sermon and he can't even explain to you simply, even, even at the beginning, you know, a lot of preachers, they give you the big idea. He's not even giving you the big idea uh, of what repentance is. That would be a good op opportunity to say that this is what repentance is. He doesn't give you the big idea. Uh, in four minutes, he's not telling you that that you, like you said, um, are a lawbreaker and a sinner by nature and by choice, and you stand uh, condemned before God, and you need right. the mercy of God. Um, and, and it's not your mercy. It's not your merit. It's not your ability. It's solely, you know, the merits of the righteousness of Christ alone that you can plead, and and only on that basis alone can you be forgiven and converted, and even grow in your sanctification. Right, First uh, John one nine. 
um, and and so much more. And so, you know, uh, John Calvin once said that great reformer that you know repentance is a start of the Christian life and it's an ongoing activity in the Christian life. And Martin Luther uh, uh, penned that those ninety five theses. The very first point uh, on the Wittenberg door was that the Christian life is a life of repentance. So, any any thoughts on that before we move to the next clip? Um, I think you summarized it really well. I mean, like you said, the, the Christian life is a life of repentance because as you grow in Christ, and look, I'm saying this because I'm experiencing this every day. As you grow in Christ, you become more aware of your sin and there's more to repent for. And you get to, you know, somebody like me, I was doing the math the other day and I've, I've been saved for 43 years. It's been a long time. And, uh, and so, you know, I'm even, even today, the Lord is revealing things to me that I need to repent of. And, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. And it's not something that should be hidden from us in false teaching. We should believe the, what the Bible says about it because that is the only thing that sets you free from your sin is when you repent from it and you put off the old, you know, whatever the sin is and put on the godly behavior and the submission to scripture and doing what Christ wants us to do. So it's really important that when we listen to a teacher, we we're sure that we are getting the whole story from scripture and he's not giving us the whole story. Amen. It's just another reason, right, why we need to be Bereans. And, yes. you know, even that Paul commends the Thessalonians in First Thessalonians 1 for receiving the word with gladness and joy. Well, they didn't right. receive they didn't receive just any word. They didn't just believe any word. They received with gladness and joy the word that Paul, the apostle, under the inspiration, you know, of the Holy Spirit was giving to them. And that's, mm -hmm. that's why we have to be, again, I think that that's a model. That's an illustration of what the, what the Bereans were actually doing in Acts 17, right. 11. So, um, of course, we also know the Thessalonians were taught later in chapter 5 to, you know, hold fast to what is good and to reject what is false. And, again, right. that's just a reminder as you're listening to these people, as you're even listening to your own pastor, Hey, if you have questions or anything, ask your pastor. Hey, I'm not really sure right. what that means because you know what? I can tell you, I'll tell you this. As somebody who has preached, who's taught for a long time, who does a lot of these podcasts, I make mistakes. Now, now the, the nice thing when you're recording it, it is that the hidden secret is you can cover over those things. You know, so you can edit out your mistakes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you're preaching, you know, you, you can't do that. You know, you, you have to <laughs> just say, hey, you know, I misspoke. You could say something like, hey, you know, I misspoke there. Um, you know, the, our, our audience would have just heard me do that. And with Dawn, even, um, you know, where I, I didn't give a full enough inf information about a particular thing about uh, Luther and the Gutenberg Press. And so I, I, I said, Dawn, after Dawn was like, hey, here's a, the wrong verse. Uh, she gave the, the wrong reference. So I, I gave gently gave the right reference. And, and then I corrected myself and said, hey, I didn't give uh, the right full information here about Luther using the Gutenberg press and, you know, God ultimately used that to spread the reformation. Um, but so, so we're all like, as you know, the more that you talk, right. Uh, the, the more likely you're, uh, to make mistakes. Uh, I think it's, uh, that's, that's, I think that's, um, what is it? Is it in Ecclesiastes? Right. Uh, uh, Are you thinking of the, let my words be few verse. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Um, yeah, exactly. So, the less you say, the less opportunity you have to misspeak, I guess. Yeah, see, see, see we're even helping each other here. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. So our uh, moving moving on, our, our next clip is, uh, I, I can't remember the exact location, that's just being honest. Um, I, I, I will try to do better at that moving forward, writing down the exact location of where John Bevere is giving this. But, the, but some of the context for this, because this is a shorter clip, the, the context for this clip is he's, he's talking about how he at one time was enslaved to pornography. And then um, as you'll hear in the clip, he's, he's talking about deliverance ministry and then um, at the end, he, he of the not of the clip, but towards the moving forward in that particular talk that he gave, 
Um, he does say that he fasted and, and seemingly, in his own words, overcame pornography um, and, at, at that time. And so uh, let's take a look at that short clip now. Okay. This man, and I know a lot of you young people will not know who he is, he had one of the greatest deliverances ministries on the planet in the 20th century. I'm alone with him, and I open up. This is the fall of 1984. I said, Brother Summerall, I am bound to lust. And I share with him. And man, I'm telling you, he rebuked me <laughs> like a good dad. <laughs> and I listened to every word he said, and I said, Brother Summerall, will you lay your hands on me and get me free from this? He said, absolutely, come here. Prayed a strong prayer. You know what happened? Nothing. Yeah, yeah, nothing, nothing happened. I mean, <laughs> who, who can't identify with somebody praying for you and then you're like, nothing happened, nothing happened. But, uh -huh. You know why nothing happened? Uh, nothing happened uh, because deliverance ministry is a bunch of unbiblical hooey. That's why yeah. nothing happened. <laughs> nothing hooey. It's hooey. That's, that's yes. Good. You know, and, and for those we, we have talked on this podcast so much about deliverance ministry. Um, so I, I just want to be extra clear about what we're talking about. Um, we talked about repentance. So when, you know, when, the, when we repent and believe, we, you know, God makes us a lot. The general call goes out. We preach Christ and am crucified to everybody. This is a general call, right? It goes out to all men. And so we, we faithfully preach Christ. We call sinners to repent and believe. And then we trust that faithful deliverance of the message, you know, from God's word to open the spirit to, then to open eyes and ears and irresistibly draw and specifically apply the message to people's hearts and lives so that you know they can rep actually repent and turn away and come you know to saving faith you know in jesus christ alone and so that i start there because that's the opposite of what these guys are saying um, with deliverance ministry it's about Christ supposedly christians not being indwelt by the spirit but having um instead demons residing within them well we know that there's nothing in the bible that says that a christian can have a demon uh, we can be oppressed you know by by demons but that we know that non-christians to be clear and actually this is interesting because don and i don don was a nar prophetess she and i have I talked about this many times just being extra clear about it you know the whole world is the bible is clear that the whole world is under the sway and the influence of satan um now a, 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 to to the degree that a christian or a non-christian excuse me could be under the the domain of darkness and used as a tool of satan um you know that that's a whole nother discussion but we're talk we're not even talking about that we're talking about John and Lisa Bevere and John saying that he himself got deliverance. And deliverance means to them that the, he as a Christian had a, quote unquote, and I use air quotes, demon of pornography. And that's, that's how they talk about it. Um, and he is actively supporting this idea that Christians can be indwelt by demons and then need deliverance uh, from that particular demon and this person that prayed over him uh it didn't work in his own words right so he's actively supporting the te people his followers john and lisa Bevere's followers say to me all the time they don't support this teaching but here you have an actual example of him supporting it in an actual message so what's what's next you know what's next you you, you can't even you can't even make that argument he's actively preaching it. we're going to look at another clip uh, that Doreen and I used before because it illustrates again that they're actively teaching this idea. Now the opposite of that, right, is what we just talked about. We just talked about biblical repentance. For the Christian, that's that's the that's the standard. You know, we're to keep short accounts with God, uh, confess our sin, turn away from it. First John one nine, um, and and see the horror of it. And like you so beautifully said. You're still growing in it. I'm still growing in my sanctification um, and, and patience and gentleness, uh, especially, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> even after 35 years of following the Lord, I'm still growing in these things. I still will till the end, till, till I go be in glory, right? Um, and that's true for all of us. We all have areas that we need to grow. But this, 
this is actually this actually de- what he's actually saying. And I doubt I, unless you know the the what the deliverance is actually saying and what they mean by what they say, and you understand the 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 truth that we're indwelt and signed and sealed, you know, in the Holy Spirit because of the blood of Christ, because we have union with Christ. Uh, we we are His and He is ours. You're not going to get the 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 danger of what um, John is actually supporting here. And people are so many people on the internet are seduced by people like this guy, um, you know, Alexander Pagani, um, Isaiah Salvador, y- you name it. And it's and it's sad and it's tragic because they're preaching another gospel. They're not preaching the gospel that saves. They're not preaching the gospel that that helps Christians understand more of the promises of God, the sufficiency of Christ, how they are held fast, and uh, as we'll talk about later, held secure, and um, how they can have fellowship with God and grow and through the means of grace. And and anyway, I I I totally took that on a maybe to another level, but any, any thoughts on any of that, anything stand out on what I said or make sense? Oh yeah, it absolutely makes sense. I, I think, I think Christians, you know, even doctrinally sound Christians who don't really need to worry about this because they're, they're not going to believe that they're indwelt by demons. They need to be aware of this because this is a growing teaching in evangelicalism that, um, that what well, let me just let, let me start my comment here with uh, a, a verse from scripture james 1 14 um says let's see is it 1 1 13 excuse me let no one say when he is tempted i am being tempted of god for god cannot be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by demons no by his own lust this idea that anytime you sin it's because you have the demon of of uh, adultery or you have the demon of gluttony or you have the demon of this or that or the other it makes you a victim you're not responsible for your sin you know it's, it's it's something that is happening to you because a demon has taken over and that is not how the bible presents sin we are responsible for our sin and we are responsible to repent from our sin you don't just you know every time you sin oh well i guess i better go down for some deliverance and and you know like you're taking your car in for an oil change or something like that and get this procedure performed on you so that this thing that is causing you to sin can be uh excised almost like it's surgery and and then you know you won't have that sin anymore that is not a biblical view of sin at all, nor is it a biblical view of our responsibility for our sin. When we sin, it's because we want to. It's not because of a demon. It's because our flesh wants to do whatever that thing is to feed our flesh and to give us pleasure or to make things easier for us or whatever the reason is. We want that more than we want God. And that's what it all comes down to. And that is how scripture presents sin and repentance. Not this idea that something is making you, you know, it's like the old, uh, old, old, old saying that they had on TV a long time ago. You know, the devil made me do it. The devil's not making you do anything, especially as a Christian. Scripture says that God always provides a way out for us when we're tempted. We do not have to sin. We want to sin. And that's because of our flesh, not because of a demon. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's really well said. You know, and 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 for we can go to Romans six, right? Uh, Paul says mm-hmm. very clearly, you know, after giving the truth about you know first three chapters of Romans about how we sin and the various ways in which we sin, you know, sexually, morally, ethically, etc., and so on. You know, chapter four and five, he talks about how we're justified, we're declared not guilty, you know, because of the perfect spotless righteousness of Christ. And then he says in that verse one of Romans six, should we just continue living however we want to? And he says, may it never be, may it, may it not happen. May it, may it never be, you know, named among the people of God. And, you know, and then he talks about how because of the righteousness of Christ, we have this new identity, which you talked about earlier, 
Um, and then, you know, the, the chapter seven, the struggle with indwelling or remaining sin, you know, that, that we're talking about, that we've been talking about, taking ownership of it, seeing it for what it is, not, not fluffing it off, not coddling it, not embracing it, but, but seeing, um, like Thomas Watson, uh, remarked in his book on repent, seeing the sight of it, seeing the horror of it, um, and then turning away from it to, uh, the the beauty you, you you we have to get back to this idea of what John John Owen even would talk about mortifying it uh, which is which is putting it to death it's because of the grace of God now you look at even we can go on to Romans 8 notice in Romans 8 all the mentions of the Holy Spirit I think there's something like almost 10 references or something like that or maybe 11 or 12 in that chapter alone about the work of the holy spirit and the life of the christian so they're indwelt by the spirit by the spirit and the spirit is taking the truth of the word and applying it and one of the things is, is that he's trying to get us to do is to put our sin to death which takes us back to chapter 6 and romans six eleven that we're supposed to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to god because of christ and so you know that's that's just the life of the christian i i'll never forget one of my mentors he was a gr great and a godly man and um i never saw him get angry or anything but he said dave i'm still growing after four he was a pastor for uh 25 years he was involved in another ministry for 10 or 15 years or so so he was in ministry 40 40 something years I never saw him get angry. I never saw him got upset. But he he would say, "I'm still growing in patience and gentleness." And he was in, he was encouraging me, by the way, to continue to grow in patience and gentleness. And and we all we all need to have our various areas that we all need to grow in. And this is the life of the Christian. Um, you know that that's what Pilgrim's Progress is all about. Uh, Christian, you know, stubs his toe and falls along the way, and he sins. Um, he, he, the Lord uses people to help him along his journey, and he makes it to the celestial city by the sustaining and persevering power of God's grace. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely true. So we have a we have another clip, and this this will probably be the bulk of our conversation here. Um, this is on uh, John and Lisa Bevere's podcast, Conversations with uh, John and Lisa. So let's take a look at that. You have a protection when you're in obedience. Yes. But when you deny God's word or his, his provision for protection in your life, and you partner with things that open the door to demonic things, yeah. Uh, he he takes legal acts. Well, that's what Paul life. was talking about yeah. with the Corinthian church. Yeah. He was saying, "Lest Satan get advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices." Do you know what he was talking about specifically there? Unforgiveness. Mm -hmm. So Paul was telling them, "Hey, when you refuse to forgive, because Jesus said, forgive us as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us.' That's right. not a suggestion. That's right. that's the Lord's prayer." Jesus said, "If you don't forgive, your heavenly Father will not forgive you." Remember, he said that. Okay, in Mark eleven. All right, so. When we refuse to forgive, we give foothold to the enemy. Um, I will never forget, ever, will I ever forget this. There was a, um, I was at CBN years ago, uh, Pat, yeah. with Pat Robinson, yeah. Terry Mewson, and they're, they're, they have a chaplain there, or, or a guy who runs like the chapel for the whole thing. He's kind of like the pastor of the staff back in those days, and he shared that there was a person who had come in that they were ministering to, and they just could not get this person free. The person wanted to be free. The person was a baby, baby Christian, wanted to get free, said, please, can you have your counselors pray for me? And he said, we were baffled until the Holy Spirit gave us a vision. And we saw a that every time we prayed for him, this person was in a wind tunnel, right? Mm -hmm. And Or excuse me, not this person. We saw a demonic spirit. We saw like a wind tunnel and a demonic spirit had a hold on a bar. And when we prayed, it was like a massive wind of the Holy Spirit went through and the, and the demon but it just had a, hung it on. It had a, a hold. It just hung on. How yeah. interesting. And, okay. and, and the Holy Spirit revealed to them, he's holding on forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So they asked him and he said what well, he started saying it was something I think it was his father or something like that. 
and they led him in a prayer to forgive. As soon as he forgave, they had another vision and they saw the wind blow and they saw that demon just gone like that. Yes. So, so it a, had legal access, a legal hold yes. because of the unforgiveness. How about Fe Ephesians? Paul says, don't let the sun go down in your wrath, right? Lest we give Satan a foot hold. That's the exact translation in the NLT, and, a foot and, hold. And can I just say, I remember when we were early married, <laughs> I, I, um, I would, if I didn't forgive you before we went to sleep at night, it was like I dreamed all night and was mad, got madder and madder and madder in the morning. I'd turn to John and be like, you know oh what you gosh. did in my dreams. You were so yeah, upset it, it was. It wasn't even a real thing, but because I had slept with that unforgiveness and that bitterness, it had taken over my mindset, had robbed me of my rest. And, and we actually are not created for that. You know, you know, so Lisa, the Bible says the whole world, literally the whole world is under the sway or the influence of the evil one. Now, I mean, that's crazy. So when you get born again, all of a sudden you are free. You you're part of the kingdom. Yep. You're part of the kingdom of God. You're technically free, but you have to drive out these enemies, just like when God said, hey, that land is yours, Israel, but you got to drive out all these enemies. Michelle, what are your thoughts on that? I have so many thoughts on that. The first thing I want to say is that when he's talking about um, this this God that they couldn't get free or or whatever, and the Holy Spirit showed them a vision of this wind tunnel, what that is blasphemy. The Holy Spirit did not show them that because that is not what God's word says about how you get free from whatever it was he was needing to get free from whatever sin it was. I don't recall what they said. Oh, gosh, read your Bible. Believe what the Bible says. Don't don't go to people and, and just believe what they say just with no with no um, biblical support. You need to go to Scripture and see what Scripture says about this. Scripture, if the let me put it this way. If the Holy Spirit had actually been speaking to them, which he does through his written word, not through little voices and visions and stuff like that. He speaks to us through his written word. But if he had been speaking to them, he would have said the way for this person to get free is that this person, if this person is lost, this is another thing. A lot of times they conflate lost people and saved people. So you can't really tell who they're talking about. And there's a difference. If this, per the Holy Spirit would have said, if this person is lost, this person needs the gospel. That is what will set him free. Okay. If this person is saved, what this person needs to do is engage in biblical repentance, not John Bevere's version of repentance, but biblical repentance for his sin. He needs to repent. He needs to put off whatever that sinful thing was and put on what the Bible says to do about it instead. He needs to study his Bible. He needs to be in prayer every day that the Lord will um, protect him from sin. You know, they mention the Lord's prayer, but they, they also say the Lord's prayer also says, lead us not into temptation. That's one of the things he needs to be praying for every day. He might possibly need, uh, some biblical counseling if it's a, if it's really got a, um, a hold on him, but basically what he needs is to be in prayer, be in his Bible. He needs to be in a doctrinally sound local church uh, where he's plugged in and faithful, not just where he drops in when he feels like it, but where he's faithful so he can receive good teaching. And he also needs pastoral counsel or another godly man to disciple him. These are God's means, not what the Beveers are saying. These are God's means. And maybe they sound boring or simple or they're not sparkly enough like all of these, you know, uh, things that they're telling you to do or that they're saying that they've gotten these visions or whatever. That's oh, that's exciting. You know, that's that's uh, like magical. It's, it's almost like, you know, you're a little kid and you're believing in the, the Disney movie magic kind of stuff like your fairy godmother or whatever. But God uses these prescribed means that he has prescribed to free us from our sin, to forgive us for our sin, not, not the stuff that they're teaching. So 
don't don't just blindly believe people who say they're telling you what the Bible says. And by the way, I noticed he did mention a couple of scripture scripture references in there. I said earlier they don't they never do that. So I stand corrected. Sometimes they do. But did you go look up those scriptures? Because they don't say what in context, they don't say what he says. They said that whatever. Um, so, yeah. So you need to be thoroughly familiar with your your Bible. You need to every time you hear stuff like this from supposedly Christian teachers, you need to be asking yourself a couple of questions. Does the Bible really say that? Because sometimes they'll tell you something the Bible just flat out does not say anywhere in any context whatsoever. And then the next question you need to be asking yourself is, what does the Bible say in context about that thing that they're teaching? Or, you know, what is the context of what they're saying? Because a lot of times they will rip these passages of scripture right out of context and they'll mix them together with other stuff and they'll present you what they think instead of what scripture actually says. You know, David, you and I were talking before we, before we started recording and I said, <clears throat> It reminds me that I'm, I'll just be showing my age here, but maybe some of y'all will understand. Years ago, when you would have like a, a an action movie or, or TV show or whatever, and there was there was a kidnapping, um, the the kidnappers would send the, a ransom note to the family or the police or whatever it was. And for, in order to write this note, they wouldn't write it with, you know, handwritten or whatever, because they didn't want their people to be able to figure out who they were by their handwriting, you know, handwriting analysis. So what they would do is they would cut letters and words and phrases out of magazines and newspapers and other places where they were in print. They were literally cutting these letters and words and phrases out of their context and putting them together in this ransom note to mean something completely different, you know, to form wor different words and phrases and, and sentences. And that is what the Beveers do with scripture. They cut out a little word or phrase from this verse and they cut out a little word or phrase from that verse and they stick them all together to mean something completely different than what they actually mean in scripture. You've got to be on your guard for that because they say these things so quickly and with such authority, you know, like he, he, in a previous video that we watched to this one, he said, repentance means thus and so in the Greek. Well, you know, when you speak from the Greek, everybody, you know, gives you a couple of extra uh, authority points when you do that, they, they look up to you a little bit more because of that. But you can't do that. You've got to you've got to know your Bible, first of all, so that when you hear these things, they're going to hit your ear wrong and you're going to automatically say, uh, I don't think scripture really says that. Let me go look at what scripture says and look it up. Um, but you can't just believe these people out of hand because they're they're conflating a lot. Like I said a second ago. A lot of times when they're talking, they seem to not be drawing lines of distinction between saved people and lost people. They're just sort of treating them the same. And scripture does not do that. Scripture says certain things about saved people and certain things about lost people. If you don't believe me, study the book of 1 John. It'll tell you, you know, saved people do this, lost people do this. And it's very, very clear. Love John. He's so black and white about those things. It's so clear. Um, but anyway, yeah, so they, they just, the biggest thing that they do, at least from the videos that we've been watching, is they take all of these things out of context or they throw them all together, you know, in a blender and make themselves a sludge slam smoothie of false doctrine um, by by taking things out of context that God said, throwing them all together, and they come out with something that God never said and God never meant. So you have to be on your guard about these things. That was that was so well said, Michelle. Um, and, and, you know, I 100% I, I agree that, you know, the danger of what they're saying um, is they're talking about this idea of legal rights we just talked about deliverance and so the idea is of of with this legal rights is that you, you have a they, they get this idea i mean it goes way back in the word of faith and in all these things but it's it's essentially there's some sort of it depends on the deliverance quote unquote deliverance ministry teacher but there's some sort of step and usually one of the final steps is repentance ironically 
Um, so you're going through and, you know, you have to identify or whatever. You have to recant and blah, blah, blah. And then you're repenting. And it's like you, you notice how he talks about, you know, legal rights. You, he talks about um, if you don't forget Jesus' words in Matthew 6, 14. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. But uh, he talks about, um, you know, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Uh, Ephesians 4, 25 and 26. Um but let me ask you a question here. For the, for the Christian, can we ever lose our security? Well, the answer to that is very clearly no. Romans 8, 31 through 39, uh, six times talks about, or five, five or six times talks about how it's because of Christ. Christ did it. Christ secured our salvation. So we're, because of the blood of Christ, we belong to him and he belongs to us. Um, the thing is, is that, that what they don't, separate here is and they don't get right is our fellowship with god can be hindered or interrupted this is you know this is to your point this is first john um one you know if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us that's by the way that's to christians that that the whole epistle it's written to Christians. He's talking to Christians. Um, mm -hmm. It's just why he goes on and says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then he goes on and talks about, and we, we often like to quote that verse, but we also need to quote uh, the, the, the first John 2, 1 through 2, that Jesus Christ is our advocate. He doesn't just say we confess our sins because he's faithful and just and righteous. That's that's true, but he also goes on and talks about Jesus being our advocate before, you know, the Father he ever lives to plead the merits of his own blood. And and so we so we have to be clear about that. So so our fellow our security is one hundred percent signed and sealed. It's our fellowship with God that can be hindered. And this is where they actually commit error. Um, and and advocating the error is anything outside the Bible, so they already are outside what the Bible says. But but where they commit heresy is telling Christians that they can they they can surrender their legal rights. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. No Christian can ever not there's not one verse. If there's a verse, you 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 email me. I would I would love that. Email me any verse that says that the Christian can surrender their legal rights their the forgiveness that they have because of the finished work of christ there's not one verse that that ever says that there's not secondly there's never any verse that makes our forgiveness because of what i've done because of what you've done or because of what anybody has done our, in other words the point is is our forgiveness is never conditional so um and that's what they're advocating when these people are saying and it's so it's so persuasive to people that are struggling with assurance. They're struggling with their sin, and so they hear that and they think, "Wow, I need to get delivered. I've surrendered my legal rights." Well, stop for a minute and think about this, Christian. What does the Bible say about you? You belong to God. Who are we talking about here? We're talking about the God who made the heavens and the earth. We're talking about the one who, who made you, as you said so well at the beginning. He made you in his image, in his likeness. And we rebelled against God, Genesis 3, uh, Romans 5, 12. And so Christ came to pay this penalty for us in our place. So then is there anything as Paul would say in Romans 8, 31 through 30, is there anything in all creation that can separate us from the love of God? That's our security. And the answer is no. So there's no, absolutely no way in heaven or on earth in, uh, that we can be separated from God because of Christ if we are in him. If you're not in him, you are separated from God. You are at war with God. You are an enemy of God. Uh, you are deserving of the punishment of God. You will stand before God and you will give an account. And uh, we know that Jesus will separate um, you know, the, 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 those who belong to him from those who don't. Uh, those who belong to the Lord, the 1 Corinthians 3, they'll stand before the beam of seat judgment and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make it uh, by the, by, some of us will make it by the skin of our necks and you know, otherwise of us will, will maybe do better. But um, you know, uh, 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 for the non-believer, they're going to you know, face the full fury and the wrath of God. And uh, that, that's a terrifying thing. And, um, you know, nobody, nobody 
That's why we should be so clear. If you can't be clear on repentance, you have no, absolutely no business. Any business. You don't have any business writing. You don't have any business podcasting. You don't have any business preaching. And you certainly should not ever be a pastor. Um, and so... This is, this is why this is so important because this is another gospel and there is no other gospel. There's only one gospel that can save us, that can lead us safely home. There's only one gospel that, that can lead us to repentance. There's only one gospel that you know can help us to grow in our sanctification. There's only one gospel that will lead us safely to heaven. And, and this is the gospel that Michelle and I are talking about. And this is over and against that. That's the danger of the gospel that John and Lisa Bevere are promoting. They, they have zero understanding of sanctification. Um, they have zero understanding of the security of the Christian. They have zero understanding of the fellowship of the Christian. And, and all, like you said, they're, they're giving this so fast. They're pumping this out. They're not explaining what they mean even when they say what they do. Um, and, and that, that's also deeply, deeply concerning. Um, and and we just we have to be clear that this is this is why I've I've spoken out so much about this is because people are when in the, when they're in a church that this teaching is being advocated often also the thing that happens is they they engage the people that are teaching this and I'm not saying John Lisa Brevere do this I, I I don't have evidence of that but but other people that teach this doctrine they they are actively engaging and i've heard this from many people they're they're in, these teachers are engaging in uh, the deliverance ministry teachers spiritual abuse and domineering leadership and people are being hurt uh not only just by this teaching but by their leadership and and uh, their emphasis on this and it, it at the end of the day michelle we know this teaching undermines the sufficiency of God's word. You just brought that out, right? New visions, dreams, revelation. But it also undermines as well the sufficiency of Christ revealed in the word. Um, so uh, any any oh. thoughts on that? Well, and, you know, another thought comes to my mind as we're discussing all this, all this stuff that they're saying there's, I don't know, maybe it's just me and my old adult brain, but it's so much to keep up with. Scripture is so much simpler, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, you were mentioning the gospel and you were talking about how also that they never explain what they mean. Well, let me explain what the gospel is so that you won't believe what what they say it is. The gospel is this. You were born a sinner and you have sinned willfully by choice because you wanted to, like we said. And the, the punishment for sinning against God is an eternity in hell. And there's nothing you can do to get out of that. We are all born into that default mode. And that is our default destination is, is hell. But Christ, God does not want to, uh, he, he takes no joy in sending people to hell, but rather that people would, would repent of their sin. And so he made a way for us to be redeemed from our sin or delivered from our sin, you might say. He sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to earth to live a perfect life so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for our sin and to pay for our sin and to atone for it and to forgive it. And so that's what Jesus was doing on the cross. When Jesus went to the cross, he died on the cross in your place to take your eternal death penalty for you so that you would not have to spend an eternity in hell. And so that's what he did. He, he lived a perfect life so he could be this perfect sacrifice, so he could die for your sin, to pay for your sin in your place. And then he was buried and he was raised again on the third day. And if you believe that, that is what will save you and set you free and deliver you and forgive your sin. And that is what will make you right with God. Not all this other stuff that they're teaching you. You know, and another thing, the legal access thing, that is crazy. Satan does not have legal access to believers. Now, there's, we could talk about another time about what Satan. Satan can and can't do with unbelievers because they are of their father, the devil. But as far as believers go, 
Satan doesn't have legal access to you because he doesn't own you. You have been bought and paid for by the blood of Christ, and you belong to him. He is your master. You are his slave. And so the master is the one who, you know, he owns you. He has legal access to you. So, and you can see that all throughout scripture. I jotted down some, some um, scriptures that came to mind here as, as I was listening to this earlier, uh, just to prove that Christ is the one that has legal access to you. First um, Corinthians six nineteen through 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you were bought with a price? Therefore, glorify God in your body. He owns your body. It's where he, the Holy Spirit dwells. That's his house. He's not letting any demons in there to live with him. Romans 6.22 says that you have become slaves of God. Okay, again, you're the slave. He's the master. He legally owns you. If you want to talk about it in legal terms, he legally owns you if you are in Christ. Um, so, you know, your, your mind and your body and your spirit no longer belong to you because you're, you're a slave of Christ, but they don't belong to Satan either. They belong to Christ. Um, so it's just, uh, it's really just crazy that, that they're speaking in these terms because it's a direct contradiction of scripture. Look, if you want to follow Christ, you need to follow what he says in his written word. Stop following what Teachers like the Beveers are telling you because they're not telling you the truth. They're lying to you, whether they realize it or not, whether it, they intend to or not. What is coming out of their mouths is lies because they belong to the father of lies. And so they speak their native language when, when they speak. They're speaking lies, even if they're not consciously aware of it, even if in their consciousness, what they think they're doing is right and what they think they're doing is Christianity. So don't listen to these people. Go to scripture, immerse yourself in scripture, sit under good teaching at your doctrinally sound local church, find out what God actually says and believe that. Uh, amen. Amen. That's really well said. You know, as as I usually do on these videos, uh, episodes, uh, Michelle, um, I, I you know we we've talked a lot. We've given you a lot of evidence. We've given you a lot of thoughts, and and now and now it's time, quite frankly, to make a choice. You know, um, so I got I got two, well, a couple couple last thoughts here, and that is one, like Michelle said, they are they go so fast through the what they're saying. You know, if you don't really know your Bible, if you don't have your Bible open, if you're not, if you haven't read it for years, even, even if, I'll even say this, even if you've read it for years, you can miss a reference and you could be like, oh, that was, that was actually a really good explanation, but you don't know where they're even talking about. Even, even if you're, you have to slow it down and watch this a couple of times at least, I think to, to, and then look at the references or even if you don't know Maybe you don't know where they're talking, and I can I can understand what I'm saying is is how somebody would be persuaded to believe that. But that's why we have to be like we talked about Bereans. We don't receive just because the the pastor said it. He quoted chapter and verse, even if they quote, even if they explain as you as any good pastor should or preacher or Bible teacher. You know they explain the context of the verse, how this book is is meets in, is in the canon, uh, why it's in the canon, um, how that passage fits within the whole, how it points to Christ. You know basic basic explanation of how to do biblical interpretation, right? what what these guys do is they do the opposite they they give you a whole fire hose of of theology but you're like is this really true and and the overwhelming answer is we dissect it as this is what you should do right um in first thessalonians 5 21 we're hold we're told to test all things well the greek word there pro properly handled it means to examine or analyze things and that's what we're that's what we're that's really at the heart of what we're doing today we're analyzing we're even dissecting we're examining is this teaching that is being advocated by them and this is just a sampling just a sampling of their teaching 
it doesn't meet the test of the Bible. Well, the answer, I think we've conclusively proved is no. And so since it's no, then you cannot listen to John and Lisa Bevere, which means they're not sound and solid teachers of the word. And like we mentioned, at the, I mentioned at the beginning, they have thousands and th hundreds of thousands of people that listen to their their YouTube, their podcasts, their I, I, I didn't even look up how many followers they have on Instagram or Facebook, and I'm, I'm sure it's a lot, you know, between the both of them. And, and so that means by consequence of what I'm saying, you should not listen to them. They are not sound. They are not going to feed you the truth. They're not going to help you to grow. Um, irrespective of the fact that the first and the primary ministry, we, we, I think we both would say that we should be listening to our biblically qualified pastor in our yes. local church, not the podcast. And I know. You're like, well, that's kind of weird. You're on a podcast. Why wouldn't you tell me to listen to the podcast? No, you listen to your sound. Podcasts are supplements. No podcast host is your pastor, even if they are a pastor. And even then, they're not your pastor. Maybe they are, but they're still not a pastor on the podcast, you know? Um, and so, anyways, we have, to, we have to say that today, right? So we have to be so clear on that so that means what i'm saying is you shouldn't listen to them you shouldn't consider what they have to say and i know a lot of people are helped by them you know it's it's i don't i don't deny that the the thing is though is is what they're saying biblical it's one thing to be supposedly helped by them but then we have to ask is what they're saying biblical and if it's not biblical then you should not receive it you are to reject reject that's what paul says in first thessalonians 5 20 reject you know what is false well we're to test it to examine it again the bereans they tested all things this is the apostle paul right the author of th uh, 13 epistles you know in the new testament um he wrote those under the inspiration of the holy spirit uh, the word of god is true it's reliable it's trustworthy it's without error, without the possibility of error it's sufficient it's clear it points us to christ he, and and still, the Bereans thought they needed to test Paul. They needed to examine what Paul was saying, and Paul commended them for that. And then, you know, of course, the Thessalonians, again, they received the word with gladness and joy. So you should not receive the word that Bevere's, the Bevere's are saying. Their kids are saying either. Uh, I had many examples. There were so many examples, and Michelle can testify. I had so many examples. It's not just John and Lisa Bevere. It's their kids. They have, they have a growing influence as well. And what they're saying by consequence and them having John and Lisa Bevere on and other people having John and Lisa Bevere uh, speak at their conferences and uh, John, John at Bethel, you can, I'll link to this if you want to watch it, but there's, that Doreen and I did, but we also talked about a clip where – John actually calls Bill Johnson, who's a total heretic. He calls him Apostle Bill uh, from again the pulpit of Bethel, and and these are things are absolutely just one hundred percent concerning enough for me to strongly urge you to stop following John and Lisa Bevere, stop paying attention to them, and and secondly, that means you stop giving money to them. Yes. You stop giving them your eyeballs. You stop giving them your hearts. You stop giving them your hard-earned money. And that applies to every false teacher that is on here. And third, third last thing, I hope, okay? Well, 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 ho hopefully, this will be my last thing, okay? But as, as a result of, of those things, okay, what I want to say very clearly is, is that you grow in the Word, Grow in your skill of the word. Grow in your handling of the word. Grow in your love for what God has given you. You, you mentioned Michelle the simple things that God has given you, but those are the those are the very things. They're not they're not the most basic things. They're they're simple enough, as Augustine said, for a child to wade into, but they're deep enough for even the most skilled scholar and knowledgeable person to spend their whole life. And there's so many, so much riches in God's word. There's so much treasure there. So mind it yourself, study it, uh, lo grow in love for it. And and I think as you do, you'll 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 be able to do what uh, Hebrews five talks about. The mature person is able to distinguish between right and wrong. 
And that's at the end of the day, if you get nothing out of these types of videos, that should be the heart. It's again, we personally are very, like you said, you said that so well. We're very personally concerned about John and Lisa Bevere. We want to, we want them to repent and believe and trust Christ and ultimately to remove themselves from the ministry so that they can l actually learn the truth and grow in godliness. But we, we also want their followers to do the same. We want their followers to, to actually know the truth and to grow in love for the truth so that they can rightly discern and be actually spiritually mature. And so... Um, it's, it's so, it's so important, you know, you know, I have, I have two parents, uh, one I just saw this past week. Um, he doesn't even recognize me. His battle with dementia is, is gotten to that point where he doesn't even recognize his own son. I've cared for him. I've loved him. I've done everything that I can. I knew that when he got this disease, um, I was thinking 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. It's been 12 years now. Um, we don't know when the Lord is going to take him. He's a, he's a sound Christian. Um, we don't know when our last day is. Um, but, we, but we do know that we have an expiration date. We will die. Every single one of us will. Um, and that we, if, we're not, if we're not thinking about, hey, what am I doing now that's going to last for all eternity um, in the light of eternity and what really matters? And it matters who we listen to, who we believe, who we're following, wh why it matters. And so that's, that's why I just want to say please stop right now today listening to this in, in the scope of 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, you might, there's 100 other guys um, if you're a guy. That you could listen to there's there's a lot of other ladies like michelle and amy that you could listen to and susan heck and we we could probably get you you would be better at giving more names than i would michelle but there's a lot of other people that, that you could be spending your time and after you're listening uh to your biblically qualified pastor preach to you so i'll, I'll kick it back to you michelle well i just i want to join you in your plea for people to please stop listening to the Beveers and anyone like them, any false teachers out there, you may think they're helping you or you may think they're helping other people, but they're not. They're not. You have never been helped by a false teacher. No one ever has. The only people that false teachers help is themselves. They help themselves to your money. You, they help themselves to the fame that you give them, to the power that their fame gives them. They, they're in it for themselves. Again, whether they're conscious of that or not. A lot. I mean, Scripture says that they are. They go on deceiving and being deceived. That's in Second Timothy. I want to say two or three, um, and you know. <sighs> So they, they aren't always conscious of what they're doing. They're deceived into thinking that they're helping people and they're really uh, telling you what scripture says and what Christianity is, but they're not. You are not being helped by these people. If you want help, go to scripture. Believe the gospel. Believe what scripture says. Go to your doctrinally sound local church and be trained in the word. So I, I, I just wanted to, you know, especially for women, reiterate that, that plea to please stop following them. They're not helping you. I mean, you may feel good when you listen to them, but them making you feel good in your sin, in the sin of believing false doctrine or in the sin of not explaining to you how to repent of your sin and all of this other stuff, that is not helping you. That is harming you. And it is spiritual abuse. Any, any kind of false teaching is abusing you spiritually because it is keeping you away from Christ. I know they claim to be teaching you what Christianity says, what God says, what the Bible says, but they're not. They're deceived and they're deceiving you. So stay away from these false teachers. Believe scripture instead. That will help you. Well, amen, Michelle. Thank you so much for joining us on today's episode of Contending for the Word. And guys and gals, thank you so much for listening or watching this episode of Contending for the Word. Until next time, God bless you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Contending for the Word. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, and follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, or X. We appreciate your support.